Hi, in this video, we want to take a look at creating thematic maps with TMAP in R. All right, so the TMAP package is for making maps, thematic maps, TMAP. Now, what's really cool about this is that it adopts a lot of the features or the idea, the spirit, the overall point of view of the grammar of graphics. Now, it's a little bit different than ggplot. It's actually a lot different from the ggplot, but it goes through the grammar of graphics structure. And so it's a very natural way to proceed to make very good uh, visualizations. Now, the thematic maps are, in my opinion, very visually appealing. And so I find that to be a huge advantage when we want to uh, show our stakeholders some uh, data points that we've got to show on a map. Okay, so let's go through an example. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take data from Pasco County Public Schools. Thank you, Pasco County Public Schools. And this is in Florida. And we're going to go through, look at their elementary school zones, their elementary schools, and their 2019 school grades. Okay. And so let's go ahead and get started. I'm just going to run through some simple examples. And then at the end, we're going to bring in multiple data sets together to pull to produce a map. All right, so first thing I need to do, I need to load the data. Now, a great feature about TMAP is that it can actually handle a wide range of different uh, geospatial data formats. So I chose to use RGDAL read OGR for this example. I could have used you know SF package, I could have used stars, either this packet, the TM. I'm sorry, the TMAP package is very flexible in what it will take in. And so that I find that to be a huge advantage because I don't want to have to fight with the version of or the representation of my data. I just want to put it into a map so I can start analyzing and start uh, you know, sharing my results with my stakeholders. So I'm going to go ahead and read in the data. And remember, my naming convention is always object class, object structure, something like that, and then a descriptive name. So there's the elementary school zones, and it's stored in a spatial polygons data frame. All right. And so we can see that we've got 48 fields going on, or 48 schools, and um, you know it's the ESRI shapefile. Now, something to always remember when I'm pulling in data, into a shape file is that the order of the data in the original data set corresponds to the order that polygons and points are plotted. So if I change the order of my data while I bring in more data, such as school grades, as I'm about to do, I'm going to screw things up. I don't want to do that. All right, so how I chose to resolve this a couple of different ways is that I create a new column called original order and that's just basically the row number. What I'm going to do, I'm going to merge my data and to double check to make sure that I didn't screw up the order of my data, I'm going to just sort it by that column. If I didn't screw anything up, if I didn't permute the rows, I'll be fine. If I did, it'll fix it. Either way, it doesn't matter because I'm taking this step to uh, work this out. Now, looking through this, they use it. So, uh, Pasco County Public Schools is not using uh, latitude and longitude to represent the location of things. And this is unusual. I mean, it's atypical, I should say. Uh, it's still mathematically solid, mathematically correct. There's no actual shortcomings of this from a math point of view, but to get things to agree better with different softwares, I want to convert things over to a more standard projection. And so I go ahead and do that. You'll notice that here I've got North American datum 83, and you'll notice that I've got feet as a unit. Huh, kind of weird, huh? All right, so I'm just going to change it by using SP package, SP transform, and I just specify what coordinate system I actually want using the uh, CRS function in here. And so now you'll notice that up here is my CRS argument before I made the switch 
here is the CRS argument after I made the switch. All right. And so now let's just go ahead and take a look at what we've got for our data. Okay, so now let's load the uh, school data. All right, so this is coming from the Florida Department of Education. Here, this is, I'm going to be focusing on the 2019 school grades. And what I'm doing here is I'm loading the data. I like everything as data frames. I don't like tibbles. So I'm using as.dataframe to convert this tibble to the format I want. If, I, if you look at the file that you download here, you'll notice that there's a few uh, metadata rows going on. I get rid of those. And that's going, I get rid of that by using the skip uh, option. And I always like to have syntactically consistent names and I'm using the gender function to give me the a very clean column name format for this. And now what I'm doing, I'm doing a merge. So it, it's kind of like a manual merge statement. What I'm doing is I'm taking the data I want that has uh, that's in that's in the left data set and I'm just going through and I'm grabbing only the ones I want. And so here's the actual data that I'm going to be joining to my spatial data set. So I have ID number, I have school grade, I have percent of points earned. Now I'm going to merge the data. So I'm doing a left join. So for left join, all.x equals true, all.y equals false, because here I'm willing to lose uh, schools in the grades file, but I'm not willing to lose schools in the geospatial file. Sort equals false, so I don't want to change row position. And just to make sure that I don't have any hit missing values that are in A, I explicitly say missing as missing values, if there are any. That way, when it comes up in, uh, when, I'm, when I'm presenting to stakeholders, it says missing instead of being completely omitted or in A. If it says in A, I might have to explain what that means. If it's completely missing, someone may think I made a mistake. So I like to put the word missing or unknown to make sure that when people look at it, they know explicitly what's going on. And so now I have my data. Now, something as important is that you'll notice that I've kept the original order of the rows. Now here, I'm going to create the school grades uh, colors. So I'll have dark green for an A, green for a B, amber, or you think yellow, for a C, red for a D, dark red for an F, and then gray for missing and incomplete. Here are the names. And to tack this onto my data set, I'm using vector notation. So I have this vector, and I have these names for each position. And you'll notice I'm taking the grades that I have so that what's gonna happen is that when there was a grade of an A, it's gonna grab dark green. When the grade was a C, it's gonna grab amber and then so on and so, so forth. And then for school names, something I'm gonna do here is I find it's a good practice to sort your uh, categorical data. It, it, so if I have categorical data and I have a target numeric value, I like to, when I'm doing data exploration, when I'm doing visualizations, is to sort the, the categories that are not ordinal by the average target value. And I find this is a good practice for giving visualizations. 
And now here for the colors, what I'm going to do, I'm going to have a gradient going from green to red based off of the, the percent points earned. All right, so in my data, so for this situation, I've got two ways to define a color, one by the school grade and one by points earned, depending on what's important for the analysis. Now, truly the, the stakeholders for the school will care about the school grade 99% of the time, but that the rest of the time, they might be interested in, well, the school was a C, but they were a high C, the school was a B, but they were a low B. You know, like the, when it gets close to the cutoffs, the numeric values are a better indication of what's going on if they wanna get more nuanced on the interpretation. And so here I'm going through, I'm using ggplot just to make a bar plot showing the number of points earned, excuse me, the percent of points earned. And then I can see this trend. And so what's nice about this is that we can see like it, here, this school, they got an A, but they got the minimum percent points needed to get that A. And we can see that the B, this B school, they, they got a B, but it was a strong B, which is going to be very different from, well, actually not very different, uh, it, which was, you know, for interpretation for like, let's say a superintendent, uh, then this B is a 54, this B is a 61. So, you know, the school needs to worry about this school slipping more than this one. Like here, this, this school, they know that if they can just put a little bit more into it, they can bump it up. And you'll notice by ordering the schools by the percent of uh, points earned, it's a lot easier to see who's high, who's low, and like which, like which schools are similar to other schools. Now here, what I'm doing is I am taking the data that I have and I'm merging the color onto there. So that plot I just made, I actually don't care about that plot. What I was doing was I was creating plot, the plot so I could grab the color off of it with ggplot. I find that this is a good way to grab a continuous gradient because the scale fill gradient two function works very nice for this purpose. The only downside of that is that I only have control over like the midpoint. And to make sure that I did not switch the order of rows, I sort the data by the original order. That protects me from messing up my rows order. All right, so now let's actually get into some real map making. Everything I've done so far was just data prep. And remember, data prep is always a big part of the process. So here, just basically the quick and easy, down and dirty, easy peasy lemon squeezy map that we can get from TMAP. So TMAP has a function called QTM. So it's a quick thematic map. I specify my geospatial data. I say which column of data determines the color. And now I just get a quick map. Boom, easy peasy lemon squeezy. Now, you'll notice that this has, these colors have nothing to do with the colors I specified earlier. But here, you know, we've got something going, something good. And this QTM is nice if I just want to get a map down fast and easy. But when I start like tailoring things, QTM is like too convenient. So whenever I'm doing like hot, like more advanced graphics, the quick and easy way is not going to be the best way. I need to have more control over what's going on. So QTM as a whole is not the way to go. I would actually recommend never even learning QTM, by the way. There's an equivalent, like uh, I think it's Qplot and ggplot2. And Hadley has openly said multiple times he considers that a mistake. And this is the corresponding version in Tmap. All right, so let's go ahead and start using the full power of thematic maps. 
And what I'm going to do is just like with ggplot, I start with a base layer, then I specify other layers after that. All right, so here I'm specifying my data set using TM shape. I specify that I want to put down the polygons and I want to color them by total possible points. Here I'm using a quantile to indicate uh, how colors are distributed. And here is the palette that I'm going to choose to use, red, yellow, and green. Now, something about making these maps, if you want to lie with statistics, the style parameter is the one you want to focus on. All right, so quantile is going to work to try and give you, you know, about an equal amount of red as green. Let's take a look down here as what happens. So what's going to happen is that because I put it on quantile, it's going to try and give us an even-ish distribution for each of the colors. All right. So if everything is like fine, so consider it like a crime map. If everything is fine and dandy and there's a little bit of crime around, then the quantile version would still come up with the darker red regions. And so if I was trying to attack a politician, let's say I'm trying to uh, get elected and uh, I want to attack the incumbent, what I could do, I could use quantile to show that things are worse than they really are because I, I know about a fourth of the map is going to be red, even though in re it, might, it might be in a situation where there's very little crime. Another flip side of that is we could use interval instead of quantile and it, you know, we can start like playing around with how we distribute the colors to give the narrative that we want. So when we start coloring maps, we need to be mindful of the fact that it's very easy to lie with maps colorings. Also consider that here, you know, this is a pretty big region of red, right? So potentially I could take a region color it in a manner that makes it makes things look worse and if it's a larger area it gives the visual impression that it's a uh, like a worse situation or I, if i want good i can also go with green now if i have low population density it might be that this isn't such a big deal because we don't have very many people out there to be impacted so we you know when we build these maps we have the ability to tinker with things to throw levers in the way that we want to, to give the narrative that we want to, we want people to see. Now, the information is correct, it's mathematically solid, but the way that we choose to proceed can change how our audience perceives things. All right, so now, to make things a little bit more even throughout, I'm going to be using bubbles this time. So this time I'm using TM bubbles instead of the entire polygon. Now, why do I do that? Well, the reason to do this is because the larger regions, when I color them, give more of a visual impression. This, they give disproportionately more visual influence than what the data is actually giving them. A good example of this is election maps, uh, red and blue, you know, red for Republicans, blue for Democrats. If you look at the middle of the country, you'll see that there is a lot of red area, even though, you know, the win loss between Republicans and Democrats really is not that big. If you were to look at, you know, the state maps, it would give you the impression by area that Republicans are absolutely dominating everything, but we know that you know a democrat is in the white house how could that be well it's because of population density and so there's kind of there's a mismatch there and so this is you know this also highlights ways for us to lie with statistics and uh give our audience impressions that we want them to believe these bubbles give a more honest representation of what's actually going on All right, now something that we can do, we can control the projection of what's happening. So remember, every single time I represent the Earth with a two-dimensional surface, there's going to be some geometric distortion. 
either length or area or something is go or possibly both is getting thrown off whenever I do a projection because I take a three dimensional object, three dimensional surface and map it to a, uh, a, a two dimensional surface. There, there is always going to be some distortion in what's going on. If you want to confirm this, look at standard, uh, you know, standard world map. Look at the size of Green Greenland and the size of Australia on the map. Then look up the uh, area of Greenland, the area of Australia. They're going to be in the opposite direction. Australia is bigger than Greenland, but if you look at the Mercator projection, it doesn't look that way. All right, so now let's go ahead and start changing the projection. So I'm going to change it to 4326. So it, I can put in standard projection numbers in there if I want. And so here I've got the projection. Here's another one. So here is the Mercator projection. Now, this one's not very good for statistical purposes because of this distortion of the area. Best example of that is Australia and Greenland. So Australia is three times larger than Greenland, but on the Mercator projection, it doesn't look that way. And so here for our purposes, it's not such a big deal because everything that we're looking at is, you know, relatively equal distance approximately you know, to the equator. And so since I'm mapping a small region, the distortion is not a problem. So to get the projection to change, I just change the parameter of projection in TM shape. Like my changing the base layer. All right, so now we can use the Winkle uh, triple projection. And so this is, uh, this was made famous by National Geographic Society. Now this one is really good for the purpose of not distorting the area that we're looking at. There's just one problem. What do you notice about the grid compared to the boundaries. Well, we can see that this boundary is getting shifted that way. It does not look parallel to over here. And so I would not use that for, use this projection for this project because when my, uh, my stakeholders take a look, they're gonna immediately uh, focus more on this position rather than the information I'm presenting. So, just because something is recommended, just because it's something better than another on some property, doesn't mean it's the best way to go. Now let's use the Eckhart 4 projection. So this is one that's very good for not distorting area. But once again, look at that. It's all slanted relative to the grid and my stakeholders would be looking at that more than the data that I'm presenting. And so I would not choose to use this for this project. Now, for what you're doing, that might be a very, very good choice, but you know, play around with your projections before you make a final choice. The bigger the area that you're attempting to map, the more important a good projection is. Now I wanna talk about changing the style. So changing the style is just really just modifying like background and uh, you know default coloring, things like that. When I use TM style to control the style, something that's going to happen is that sometimes if I put in a palette manually, that palette will be accepted sometimes, sometimes it won't. So if you use TM style and you want to have, you may or may not have control of what the color palette is. I played around with these and some sometimes it overwrote the palette I put in, sometimes it didn't. I'm showing it, I'm gonna show everything with default palette. All right, so how I'm gonna proceed is I'm gonna make a base map here. I'm gonna call it P to be consistent with the ggplot standard. 
And now, so here's the baseline map. I am going to just change the style to white. So white is the default map. So nothing is going to change on this one. It's the same map we saw a moment ago. Now let's change the style to gray. We see that we get a gray background. All right. I mean, that makes perfect sense. Next, we're going to look at gray, but spelled with a G, was spelled with an E this time. So I get, uh, you know, same map. Now right, I can go natural. And you'll notice that also the legends features change visually as I change different styles. Like here, I can't see the northwest corner of the county. black and white, and you'll notice that here, the legend is not blocking out any of the geographic features. And, and we can mess with the legend aspects if we want and change things up, but here I'm just showing you the default features. Here is classic, and notice you have a double bounding uh, boundary, double boundary around your plot. I think it's trying to look like an old, old map. Here's cobalt. So it puts a dark blue background. Here's albatross, which is a, like a redder palette with a blue background. Here we've got beaver. Now here is, this one is colorblind. So this one is a better choice if you're gonna be presenting to those who are colorblind. All right, so now the trick to using multiple uh, spatial data sets in TMAP is to use multiple TM shape calls in your plot. All right, so what we're gonna do, I'm gonna pull in some data, and I'm, I'm actually going to demonstrate two concepts on this. One, I'm going to be adding on data from one spatial data set onto another, and then I'm going to demonstrate how I could potentially have two distinct spatial data sets used in a visualization. All right, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to get the location, the geospatial coordinates for each of the schools. All right, so one thing I need to talk about before I go any further, we go up here, you see these bubbles? You'll notice that these bubbles correspond to the geometric center of the plotted points of the boundary. All right, so what has happened is that these points are basically taken as the uh, X, coordinate and x and y coordinate average of their respective polygon. Now, something that can happen if I have like an L shape, a U shape, a V shape region, that point may or not be in the average point may or not be inside the actual polygon itself. Also, a bigger issue for this is that these bubbles that I plotted are not where the schools are. So if I'm looking at this, if I'm a parent trying to choose where I'm going to put my kid in school, I'm looking at, if I'm looking at this map, this isn't going to really help me because this tells me about the school zones, not the school location. And so what I want to do, I want to put these dots where the school is. So that way, as I look at this, I have a better reference of how far the school is when I make this decision. And to get that information, I had to pull in another data set. So this data set, which I label location, spatial polygon data frame location, has the actual location of each of the schools. And it's got 49 features. Now, if you'll remember, there were 48 school zones. 49 here means that there is a school in this data set that does not have a school zone in the other data set. And if you remember, we were working with the North American datum that it was working in feet. So to go ahead and construct and get things consistent, 
I'm going to go ahead and transform just like I did before. All right. And now I want to show you what is the value of the information that I brought in. So here, I'm just going to do a real quick map. TM shape, put in the location geospatial data set, and I'll put TM dots. So all this data set has is the location of the schools, and it just puts them down. So here, this is the uh, most northeast school in Pasco County. This one is going to be the most southwest school in Pasco County. All right, now to pull in that information into my polygons data set. So I want the, the location points data set pulled into the polygons data set. So what I will do is I'm going to take, I'm going to go through and I'm going to make a row number on the location that corresponds to the ID number. And then I'm going to reorder the data set by the cost center. So here you'll notice that this is the data set with the location of the school. This is the data set with the school zone. I'm using the school zone data set ID number and row number, row ID from latitude and longitude to get the order the way I want it to. And then what I'm going to do is I just tack it into the slot of coordinates. So in the RG doll framework, spatial polygon data frames have a coordinate slot. If you inspect this data set previously, the coordinate slot is not filled in. What I'm doing here is I'm filling that, in. I'm using another data set to fill that in. So now it's actually part of it. Something that is important about this is I have to make sure everything matches up with the data set I had originally, or everything will go haywire. Now, I want to go ahead and add school names on, and the terms elementary and academy are redundant. They're not informative for this purpose because we know their schools, so I don't need, and we know their elementary schools, so I don't need these terms. I just go ahead and get rid of them with a G sub statement. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to make the actual map. So here is TM shape. All right, so here I'm grabbing the polygons. I'm putting down the border for the school zones. And I go ahead and just slap down the dot. Now the dot corresponds to these coordinates up here. Then once again, I do TM shape and then I run through. Now, if I just want to put a regular dot without any additional information on it, I could have gone location on this and it would have worked out perfectly. So the way to get multiple data sets into a TM map map is to use tm shape multiple times once for each time this call was for the purpose of getting the polygons uh, onto the page this call is for putting down the bubbles where the school's located and filling in the bubble by the appropriate color and so now i have it now, unfortunately, the school names are kind of crowded. If I made it bigger, if I zoomed in, that wouldn't be a problem. But we can, you know, if you spend some time looking at this, you can figure out that here is Woodlands, here is West Zephyr Hills. It gets a little bit more crowded where we have more schools and less area. But if I want to, I could always zoom in. I could save this as a PNG and then zoom in a little bit more. I could also change the size of the font. I left it on default for this one. All right, well, that's all I've got for you. Take care and goodbye.